I'm going to do is talk just a little bit about the basics of social media, which is not as big a deal as you see when you read about it in papers and on TV and all that. I'm going to talk about how it's been effective in the past in ways that we really don't call it social media. But what I'm going to do, too, is start talking about real things in terms of the way it applies to us in our lives. And I'm then going to segue into what I see happening with the use of social media as it serves uh, active service troops, as it serves veterans and uh, military spouses. What's social media about? From my point of view, it's just about people talking with each other, but they're usually they're talking using mass media of some form. What they often want to do is get something real going in a big way, using the technology of the times. St. Paul, he used uh, letters, epistles. He invented a network, a church store and forward network, to get the word out. And his social media actually turned out to be pretty effective. Those letters were normally called epistles, but from my point of view, they're blogs. <laughs> and uh, notice that I, I don't uh, necessarily feel bound by the terminology of the time, but the deal is that that was a network, people passing messages one by one, reproducing them in small numbers, but getting them from uh, node to node, that is, from church to church, it worked. Later on, you know, one of my fellow nerds named Gutenberg, he invented some pretty cool technology. And in the great Silicon Valley tradition, he screwed up the financing. He lost control of his invention to his financiers. But what really happened was that a guy named Martin Luther, who had some real definite ideas about the way it should happen, he used this new printing press along with the existing church store and forward network. And uh, Luther got an awful lot done. He did learn something about social media practice this way, though. When you're sending out messages in substantial numbers, but to individuals, that means you get to choose what your own version of the message is. So you may, you may get the message from Luther, but you may have a different idea of what God wants you to do and what you're f going to form your own church about. So when you do social media, it's grassroots, and the people, the grassroots, they decide what uh, they're going to do. A little later on, a guy named John Locke helped trigger the glorious British Revolution of 1688, where they invented their form of representative democracy. And it worked. Their system, well, maybe we like, it, uh, we like ours more. But the deal is that the work of John Locke was taken up by Tom Paine and Ben Franklin, also bloggers with their own printing presses and their own networks. Uh, in that time frame, they developed a, a very, very powerful new technology which helped expedite the transmission of uh, messaging, this technology called coffee. And the deal is they created networks of coffee houses, which is where stock markets were formed, and it's where messages got from one place to another. While well, making light of that, caffeine is one of the more powerful technologies which has fueled a lot of this since the 1600s. <laughs> and uh, for that matter, you see modern politics. You know, you'll hear people in the news talking about how many followers on Twitter or Facebook Obama has, how many followers Romney has, and all that stuff. It's become a big part of our politics. Things are changing. Things are happening. What's changed on the technology side was that, well, a printing press can get a lot of messages out, but any of us using email, or maybe a message board, maybe Facebook, Instead of transing, uh, transmitting a few messages at a time, we can do a whole lot of them. And more and more people in our country have internet access in some form. More and more people have internet access in their pockets on smartphones. That's about half the market now. So we now have tools, communication tools, which we carry around with us. And the barrier to entry, the cost of getting your message out, is kind of close to zero, just before Getting a printing press or a TV station, not cheap. Now, we got all sorts of cheap mechanisms we can use to get the word out. The hard parts, of course, are getting people to work with you. Other complications, you know. Um, you know, 
before all this electronic stuff, the image that people had of you might be based on what you actually do, what your good works are, how you can talk. But now in social media, if you got a mean girl situation, they can create a rumor, a lie, and it travels a lot faster using electronic media than, uh, than we can stop. There's a Winston Churchill quote saying that uh, a lie can, uh, can span the globe in minutes while the truth is still getting its pants on. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's a situation that uh, we're all going to be in. And this means that all of us, especially as vets, you've got to define yourselves before someone else is doing it to you. Because one thing, you go on TV, they have uh, an idea of what vets are about or active service troops. Usually so over romanticized that you know it's not real. Sometimes they under romanticize it when it comes to things like PTSD. And you know, I'm a civilian. I have no idea what your experiences are like. I have no idea what's real. And that's what I know. I know not to believe except what you guys tell me. So actually I'm encouraging, um, I'm encouraging people in some of the commands that I talk to to be more open and to have uh, people while serving even do little videos talking about what they really do. Because I know that most of what uh, active duty troops do is not engage in firefights. Um, I know that happens, but you know, I even know enough history to know the importance of logistics. Because an army isn't going to march without food. So this is a really big deal. Facebook stuff, Twitter stuff, this is something that, uh, well, you want to learn to create your own identity before someone else does it to you. And in that context, you know, we talk about resumes as ways of articulating what we're about, what our job skills are and all that. And we're finding that social media with video built in and stuff like that, those are beginning to be the new ways that people are telling you what's it, what's it about because you know, even though I know better, there's so much about real military life that I don't get at all. And the only way that you can tell a prospective employer about it is to speak frankly, maybe to use some video and just tell people. Sometimes people are reticent to tell people. But uh, like I, something I halfway know about is that, uh, well, if you're an officer, from what I hear, not that hard to get a job. This is just what I'm told from some folks. Less hard than if you're a grunt. And also I'm thinking, this is what I'm told, if you're a platoon leader, you know, where you're dropped into a firefight and you gotta decide in a hurry who you're gonna kill under rules of engagement, that's the kind of skill that we need in business. Presumably without the killing part. <laughs> so that's why social media is important to you. Again, if you don't define what you're about, as individuals or as a service, other people are going to do it to you. Sometimes they'll be your friends, and sometimes they're not going to be your friends. I can, I've seen firsthand the Department of Defense looking at social media in a big way. And it turns out they were a lot more uh, savvy than I thought they would be. That changed my whole attitude of the military around. Guy know, a uh, former Secret Service. I worked with him during his last year at a local branch. He uh, brokers a meeting with a lot of Homeland Security, a lot of Defense Department, and people like me in the computer industry. About a year after, I heard that's the meeting where they decided to allow troops, even while deployed, to use social media. Other stuff going on, and the president, days ago, just announced some improvements in terms of transition from medical service. But the message here is that if I, I'm looking for simple things that I can actually articulate that other people will understand and be annoyed about just the right amount. Plus, I'm much uh, funnier than anyone else they deal with. <laughs> One thing also is that vets on their way out need to be told how to talk about what their jobs were in civilian terms. And again, the hardest kinds of experiences to describe the value of, like I said, a platoon leader, fire team leader, I barely know these words. But the skill to keep your head under fire 
is a really big business skill, but no one in business, hiring managers, they just don't talk about it. I mean, I know more than any of them just because I've heard about it a little bit. So that's the kind of thing that you're, uh, that you're dealing with. On the home front, over the last few days, in fact, uh, la from uh, last Thursday, what's crystallized in my head is how I think I want to go about building a grassroots network of the most capable and motivated and pissed off people involved in this arena, and that's military spouses. <laughs> because I talk to them, I'm working with the uh, Blue Star families and the National Military Families Association in particular. They're uh, responsible in part for my education. Uh, they know what they're doing, and I'm telling them that there's already networks of spouses at bases. There are networks which connect those networks, and maybe we find some things which manage to unite them in some small things to actually get stuff done. For vets, a lot of things are happening right now. Uh, a lot of networks going on uh, through IAVA, the Iraq and Afghanistan Vets of America. There's the community of vets, which uh, helps people figure stuff out and how to help each other. There's a National Resource Directory version 2, which has an immense number of uh, useful resources, although I'm talking with the families about uh, how useful is it really, and then how do we build a useful National Resource Directory. And I hope that was tactfully <coughs> phrased. The tools my social media consultants tell me for, that you might focus on are Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and then maybe also Twitter and uh, Google+. But there are good things going on. I just have to find out, are the numbers inflated in terms of hiring? The Chamber of Commerce and groups like IAVA are running job fairs. There was one here. That I know they can be somewhat effective, but uh, how effective are they really? What do we do, got to do to make them really happen? Because you know the people running these don't know social media. So what I do is I annoy them into sending me links, which I can post on my Facebook page. And typically what happens is that 10 other people will post them on their Facebook pages with the possible result, maybe a half dozen vets get a job. The idea is to get to other people's attention to get them doing this kind of stuff. Other stuff, too, some things uh, may be more controversial. And this one is. Uh, when I, as a civilian, submit a tax form, the IRS trusts me. Uh, writes me a check, maybe checks on me for fraud prevention later on. Well, I trust vets, and there's a lot of uh, stuff going on with vets which can take months or years to approve. Uh, it seems to me there's something wrong there. Again, so the social media stuff, you know it. Maybe you just need a hand getting started. Your kids can do that for you. Social media in older forms has been around 2,000 years, the way I count it. But back then, it was way expensive. And now it's cheap and easy. In a way, the problem is getting people's attention, since a lot of people are competing for the attention of a lot of people. But you know, uh, Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin made it work for us. And we see it in politics th these days. It, uh, Sometimes it's less annoying than a lot of political ads because you've got to go find the social media political stuff. Because I don't know about you, but I'm already very tired of political ads, and I've barely seen any, <laughs> thanks to a 30-second TiVo skip, which is a, a true blessing. So that's the, and, well, the, the story here is that people are using these kinds of social media, social networking, where vets where military spouses are actually using it to actually do something good, something important. Because my bottom line, again, is that if a troop is willing to go overseas or wherever and risk a bullet to protect me, that means something to me. With the wars winding down, um, a lot of civilians uh, well, are not only forgetting that, but never really noticed. And so this is my way of, uh, I guess, giving back in that way. Also, it annoys me that when I was growing up, 
seeing Vietnam vets uh, abused, I was pretty naive, but I knew that was wrong. So this is my way of uh, paying it forward. And I don't know very much, but I know for sure that a nerd's got to do what a nerd's got to do. <laughs> The way I got involved in the Vet Success Center is that just I heard about it, it made sense to me, it fit within my discretionary uh, spending abilities. And again, when you put computers and internet together, you give people a voice. And that's what makes sense to me, because most people in the world have never had any kind of voice. No one hears them. Now, from my point of view, this is one place where I'm doing it. I'm helping out a bit at the CCSF Student Vets Lounge. I'm also helping out at the uh, Women's Building in the Mission. Helping out, or will be helping out, at Salvation Army Harbor Light. Now, helping out in Haiti, uh, two places in Kenya, including the Dadaab Refugee Camp, which has about 750,000 refugees there, which makes it as big as here, not in the refugee count. Um, and moving, uh, moving beyond that, the deal is, yeah, I just committed to helping out a place in Uganda named uh, Gulu. Oh, and of course, helping out by wiring together the vocational schools in the West Bank. And I should add, with the support of the American, Israeli, and Palestinian governments, so no one come after me with an AK. <laughs> the deal is that uh, this is my idea of a... Uh, network where people can get together and get stuff done and maybe talk to each other. And what they're finding is that when the kids do it, without help from adults, they'll do fine. There's some scary situations which I'm in, well, which I'm tangentially involved with where, uh, you know, they're having me stay away from, let's say, Yemen or Gaza. Because remember, I'm not very tough. There's a broad consensus in uh, the communities here that I should be kept away not only from automatic weapons, but also from power tools, <laughs> which is embarrassing because my fiance is adept with power tools. <laughs> but that's San Francisco for you. <laughs> What's the most innovative social technology I've seen is uh, not a technology at all. It's listening to your customers over a period of years. And for me, it's been a uh, over 17, find out what they want, help them out when they're being disinformed, but addressing what they say that they actually uh, need over that uh, period of time. Um, innovation does not mean doing what's new for the sake of newness. Yeah, that's a hard one, because when I, uh, when I started things as a nerd, I wanted to do all sorts of cool things. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have the resources to do them, and the fortunate part is that in almost every case I'm thinking, people told us they didn't want that stuff anyway. Wow. About predicting things 10 years into the future, I do very little of because when I was a teenage nerd, I was sure by now we'd have lunar colonies, jetpacks, <laughs> and that's not just, just a common joke. I seriously believed in that stuff. What I am saying is that by 2020, the landscape of power and media and entertainment is going to be changed pretty dramatically because with social media, people like us, and I'm actually and I'm working with a lot of people who, by working together, acquire serious power to counterbalance the kind of power that people get by being born rich. So that's coming into a new balance. That's not revolution. It's just a kind of political evolution. And that's the big part of things. The only technological part that I guess I'd predict is that uh, I think we're going to see uh, uh, handheld devices being ubiquitous. We're going to be carrying our systems around with us. And when you get to work or home, you may just put your phone on the desk. It'll connect automatically to a uh, bigger screen and uh, to a keyboard or whatever. So things will change that way. I am kind of excited about the Google Glasses thing, but I, uh, I don't want to predict too much about that because it's, uh, 
it's, it's nerdy, too nerdy even for me, even, <laughs> even though I will use one. Okay. Yeah. This is actually something I have talked about with local VA. They now have Facebook pages for every VA medical center. Uh, and I've been remiss in getting the word out and then getting the word out again. The deal, and I'm thinking out loud, the deals I can work with Brandon Friedman, who runs a lot of this out of A10 Vermont, and the idea is that to post something about a, uh, I guess to post every, well to post frequently, both the umbrella page and then maybe something about a specific VA medical center, just to remind people, because right now I think they have more capacity than they need because not enough people have heard what they have to offer. Now, from what I'm hearing, you know, like a lot of resource planning wasn't done last decade. So a lot of new people coming into the system might swamp it. And I'm actually talking to some people about that kind of thing. But the deal is that the re there's resources there. They're not being used. And what I need to do is get to get uh, Kerry and Judy. I need to mildly annoy them to uh, remind me to do something. So I figure what I can do is get work with Brandon and Judy and Kerry, those are the ones I know, you know, to start annoying me about, who knows, once a week, say, I post something talking about the uh, directory of VA Facebook pages, and then uh, every week I feature one, and maybe that means something. Because, well, okay, right now, I haven't really tried hard to get a big following on Facebook. I got uh, over a couple hundred thousand uh, subscribers. And that's, that's not bad, but uh, I think of myself as the Lady Gaga of the nerds. <laughs> so I should be going for millions. And I don't know how to do that yet, because I, I only do it organically, one by one. But, uh, I mean, that's what, if we all do what it takes. I mean, if there's ever some meeting like this, a big one, and if I think it's effective for me to borrow the egg that she was delivered in for the Grammys, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm not going to wear the meat suit. <laughs> yeah, and nothing revealing, folks. Frankly, no one wants me to wear anything revealing. Trust me. Uh, but that's the deal, is that uh, stuff can happen. And again, I'm repeating myself deliberately. That is that the civilian population, myself included, uh, we don't have much of a clue. And the only way we're going to get that clue is for a whole bunch of people like me to start saying things about this and then to say them uh, relentlessly. And that's the job. But that relentless quality is something I hope to get most from the uh, military spouses. <laughs> Basically, the, uh, the, the path my team would like you to do would be to go to craigconnects.org slash connect, and someone to fill in there. If someone really uh, wants, you can email craig at craigslist.org. That's really me, but I'll probably put it through the same process. I have a team around me, partially because I'm kind of overloaded. My uh, days these days, I do a customer service for Craigslist. And again, that's about it. Nothing in management, no decision making. And I'll do some combination of public service and philanthropy. But each and every day, I'm doing some work, either for families and vets, or increasingly for election protection. Uh, the word there is simply, if you read the papers, a lot of people, a lot of Americans, are not going to be able to vote unless they get a hand. And you know, uh, you guys went overseas to fight for the right of Americans to vote, you know, whether they're new Americans, no matter what their ethnic background is or whatever. As far as I'm concerned, I'm an immigrant, even though uh, I'm second generation here. And uh, this is my way of fighting for the uh, franchise for everyone. I don't want to let anyone get screwed out of it. <laughs>